Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my first week teaching on how to find God's will. And I tell you, this is just an exciting teaching for me because this is what turned my life around. When I got to finding, seeking uh, God's will for my life, that's what turned my life around and jump-started my whole relationship with God. And I think it's going to be the same for many of you. There are some of you that have been born again and you love God, but you just don't seem to have the, uh, the motivation to do things. And it's because you don't know what God's will for your life is. When you find that God made you on purpose and has a reason for your existence and everything about you, everything about you is all geared to fulfill this purpose, it just gives your life a significance that you don't have otherwise. And there are many of you missing that because you don't know what God's will is. So this is what we've been teaching on. We're now beginning the second teaching in this first album entitled How to Find God's Will. I'm actually going to teach on how to find God's will, how to follow God's will, and how to fulfill God's will. And it's going to be a prolonged teaching, but this is foundational stuff. If you don't know these things, I guarantee you, your life, it doesn't matter how much momentum you build up. If you are going the wrong direction, <laughs> you're going to crash. You're going to have problems. And I think that this is why a lot of people have problems. Let me also say this, that I've had a series entitled How to Find God's Will that was a three teaching part. Now I've expanded it to five. I had another series that was entitled uh, How to Fulfill Your Destiny, and I've kind of combined those two, but this, this new teaching, this is a brand new teaching that I'm doing, it is not just a combination of those two teachings because I've put some extra things in it. For instance, what I'm going to talk about today is new and it's not in either one of those two previous teachings that I had. And here's the reason that I've got this teaching. This teaching is entitled, It's Never Too Late. And the reason I put this in is because when I started teaching this at our Orlando Gospel Truth Seminar back in the first part of 2010, uh, February I believe it was, when I taught that, I really ministered strong about how that God created you with a purpose and that purpose was preordained before you were even conceived, before you were ever birthed. God had already written out all of these details of your life. And when I made this point, this is so counterculture to the way most people think today, even Christian culture, that it just startled people. And I asked people to stand, and I bet you at least 80, probably 90 percent of all of the people that were at this Gospel Truth Seminar stood for prayer. And then I had people come to me and they're saying, man, I now realize that God had a preordained plan for my life, and yet I've messed it up. I've screwed it up so bad. How do I get from where I am back to where I'm supposed to go? And even though I believe that this is necessary for you to realize that God has a plan for your life, and it's not up to you to pick and choose, I believe it's essential that you come to that place at the same time, this causes sometimes a sense of frustration or hopelessness, like I've messed it up. I ruined my God-given purpose, and what do I do? And so what I want to do, and, and this is the reason I put this in there, is because I had so many people come to me who were distraught by this that I needed to come up with some encouragement, and I just want to take some scriptures and show you it's never too late, give you the example of some people who really messed up what God wanted them to do and how God was able to turn it around. You know, I use this example, and I think this is really good. Some of you have those GPS devices where it tells you turn by turn what to do. And if you make a wrong turn, I've got two or three of these GPS devices, and one of them, every time you make a wrong turn, you have this voice come on that says recalculating, and it says it in a very <laughs> condemning way. And like you idiot, you made the wrong turn. I'm going to have to recalculate. But my point is that even if you make a wrong turn, did you know that the GPS device doesn't just say, well, you turned wrong, you'll never get there now. What it does, it recalculates. 
And regardless of whether you turned right when you were supposed to turn left or whatever you did, that GPS device will sit there and recalculate a new route and get you back on track and eventually get you to the right place. You may go round about and not get there the shortest way. The best way, you might go away that it causes you hardship and stuff, but it can still get you back on track. And here's my point. If a man-made device, a GPS device, can recalculate and get you back on track, I believe God can at least do as well. Amen. I guarantee you, regardless of how far off track, regardless of whether you have even been moving or not, God can calculate a position where you are back to where He wants you to go, and it's never too late. God can get you moving in the right direction. And I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to talk about David and Saul, and this is going to be a statement that will shock some of you. But don't throw this out just because it's different than what you've heard. Let me prove this to you from the Word of God. That David was never God's first choice. It wasn't God's perfect will. David was a response to the failure of Saul. And so David is like plan B or plan C. And yet, if you know anything about the Bible, David was one of the mightiest characters in the Old Testament. God used him to really establish and um, get the nation of Israel going. And he was a powerful king. And here we are, thousands of years later, still talking about him. There's scriptures that talk about the sure mercies of David, that Jesus was the son of David. And just David was, I mean, essential. He's one of the major characters in the Bible. And yet, he never was God's first choice. This wasn't God's perfect will. Now, I know that that just shocked some of you, but let me show you some scripture that says that. Here in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 13, I won't take time to read all of the previous verses, but this is talking about Saul, the very first king that ruled over the nation of Israel. And when he was in his second year of his reign, uh, he was going to go out and fight with this group of people. I think it was the Philistines. And... Uh, Samuel, the prophet, told him to wait seven days, and then Samuel would come and offer this sacrifice, and after the offering of the sacrifice, they would engage the battle. So they were going to plead for God's blessing on them before they went out to battle, and Samuel was late in coming, and so Saul took it upon himself to get out of the ministry of a king and get into the ministry of a priest, which was a major, major no in God's sight. In Leviticus chapter 10, there was even two priests, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They offered strange fire. Now, they were priests, and they were anointed by God to offer these sacrifices, but they didn't do it according to the exact order that God set down, and because of it, fire came out from off the altar and killed them. Now, those were priests who were anointed to offer sacrifices, but they didn't follow God's direction, and boy, the wrath of God hit them. It was even worse for a person who was a king who was not supposed to have anything to do with sacrifices. Later on, you find one of the uh, kings of Israel, Uzziah, went in and he took upon himself to become a priest. And he went in and the priests were yelling at him saying, King, it doesn't belong to you to do this. You shouldn't be doing this. And yet he was just so lifted up with pride, he thought that he could do anything. He went in and took over the office of a priest and God smote him with leprosy. And I mean, he was just instantly covered with leprosy and he remained a leper until the day of his death. So my point is that you could not violate that priesthood office. There was only certain people that could offer the sacrifices. And yet Saul went ahead and offered a sacrifice contrary to what the instructions were. And as soon as he got through with offering this sacrifice, it says that Samuel appeared. Boy, that's, there's an important point here. I'm not going to teach on that, but that is really powerful. You know, the Scripture says that God has never allowed us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And so, you know, sometimes you feel like, well, I just can't wait any longer. I've got to do something. But God says that you can always bear it. There is always a way to do what God told you to do. Don't ever feel pressured into doing something. As soon as Saul had violated 
the priesthood and offered this sacrifice himself, as soon as he got through with it, Samuel came on the scene. In verse 10, this is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Now, see, Saul here is trying to rationalize and justify what he had done, and he was talking about, but we couldn't go to battle without entreating the Lord. Did you know to most people that sounds pretty good logic? Well, yeah, you had to do this. No, there is no excuse, no excuse for ever doing anything contrary to God's instructions. There's some people that say, well, I, I just had to do this. I, I couldn't stay with this woman any longer. I've just taken all I could take. The Bible says that God's kind of love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. There is no excuse for us not doing what God told us to do. Now, there's forgiveness and mercy, but there's no excuse and see, he was trying to make an excuse, and he says, I forced myself. The very fact that he said this, I forced myself, shows that he knew it was wrong. There was a reservation. There was a hindrance, a hesitancy in his heart about doing this. He knew he shouldn't have done it, but he forced himself to do it. See, every one of us, when we do something wrong, we know that it's wrong. And yet we justify it, and we think, well, I should... You know, the Scripture says that we should not put a novice in a position of authority out of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And yet, we violate that constantly because we think, oh, but the need is so great, and we need people to help, and this person is willing, and even though they are brand new, and I know that they aren't mature, we just force ourselves to violate God's instructions. And because of it, we put people on the front lines that aren't prepared. They got a big target drawn on them. Satan takes them out. And those people, there are so many people that have been hurt and abused because we didn't follow the instructions of God's Word. Man, you could, I could just go on and make applications of that. That's powerful. But see, here's Saul doing what so many of us are doing. We know we shouldn't, but we go ahead and violate God's instructions because uh, it's just so urgent. Uh, our finances, we just can't do it, God, because I don't have enough money or we're afraid that this is going to be an imposition on our family or we just have a million and one reasons to disobey God. But look what Samuel said in verse 13. Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. And I can say that to myself and to every one of us that every time we have violated what God put in our heart, it doesn't matter how good you think your logic is, you just do what God tells you to do. You know, I remember one guy who came to me into my office, and he started by saying, God told me to come to your Bible college. That's the first words that he said. And then he says, but the pastor of my church believes that you're a cult. He doesn't believe you're a godly guy at all. And, and then my parents they think that you're weird, and they don't agree with it. And so my parents had the pastor come talk to me, and I'm going to lose my job, and I have a lot of opportunity for advancement. And he says, I've got this car payment, and I've got this and this. And he started listing all of these things, parents, pastor, job, obligations, finances, this reason, that reason. And he listed a dozen things. And then he says, so what do you think I should do? And I said, you lost me the moment God, you said, God told you to come to this Bible school. I said, if God told you to come to this Bible school, then just do it. If it hair lips every devil in hell, you just do it. You just do it. It doesn't matter if anybody else agrees with it. You do what God tells you to do. End of discussion. Anyway, he wound up coming to the school, graduated. It's been a great experience for him, and it all worked out. But see, there's some of you that you know God has led you to do something, and yet you've let circumstances. I, I talk to people all the time that say, but I have five or ten years left on my job, and then I can retire with a pension and get this guaranteed income. And it just seems to me like it would be wisdom for me to stay here for another five or ten years. 
You know what? If God told you to do something now, you would be better off to obey God and forget the pension and forget the retirement. Now, I'm not telling you to do, I'm not telling you to turn off your brain and not use wisdom if you've got, you know, a situation where you're a year or two away from retirement. I'm not telling you not to do that, but I'm saying if God speaks to you and tells you to do something now, I'm telling you to obey God above natural wisdom, above what your family has to say about it, above anything else. And I could say with Samuel here, when he said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. It doesn't matter what the logic is. It doesn't matter what's happening in the stock market or in the job market or if the cost of living is higher here in Colorado Springs than it is where you live. If God tells you to come here, if God tells you to do something else, you just do it. We've had people before say things like, but I've got two dogs and I can't come. <laughs> and you know what? We allow dogs in Colorado. It's not a problem. I don't know why people, that's, th that bothers them. And I had one guy that says, but I'm homeless. I'm living on the street. How could I come to Bible college? And I said, you know what? We got streets in Colorado Springs. <laughs> and you could be homeless in Colorado Springs, the same as you could be homeless wherever you're coming from. Plus, if you would obey God and do what he tells you to and get into that place called there where God called you to be, you would find that there would be a blessing on you and you wouldn't be homeless. God would provide for you. It's amazing the way that people come up with excuses. See, Paul, Saul had made all of these excuses, and yet Samuel said, You have done foolishly, for thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Now, this is a small thing, and most people skip this, but I want to just point out some things here and show you how dramatic this statement is. Samuel, the messenger of God, is saying that, Saul, if you would have obeyed God, if you would have waited and let me offer this sacrifice and you not have violated the rules that God put down about what a king could do and what a priest could do, if you would have obeyed God today, it says that God would have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. You know what this means? This means that we would have never heard of David if Saul would have obeyed God. David was from the tribe of Judah. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And the, the kingship or the rulership over Israel would have been in the tribe of Judah or Benjamin. And it, we wouldn't have ever heard of David. You know, this is a little hard for us to grasp hold of because David is such a central figure in the Bible. And so we've just, most of us can't even conceive this. But this verse is saying that if Saul would have been obedient to God, that God would have established his kingdom over Israel forever. Not just for the next hundred years or whatever, but forever. Instead of talking about the sure mercies of David, we'd have been talking about the sure mercies of Saul. Saul wasn't just a fill-in until God could raise up the right person. Saul was God's first choice. Saul had a preordained path that God wanted him to follow, and it would have established all of Saul's descendants as the kings of Israel if he would have obeyed God in this instance, but he disobeyed God. Now, this teaches us a number of things. It shows that God's will doesn't automatically come to pass. God has a purpose for each life, but it doesn't come to pass automatically. And it also shows us that David was not God's first choice. David actually was an afterthought. As a matter of fact, in the very next verse, it says in verse 14, Now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath, talking about hath, means it's already been done, it's already in process, hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. If you go back to the first verse of this 13th chapter of 1 Samuel, it says Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, all of these things happened. So this happened in the second year of his reign. 
we find out in other scriptures that Saul reigned over Israel for 40 years. So he reigned 38 years more after this happened. When David finally took the kingdom, you can find this over in 2 Samuel chapter 2, David was 30 years old when Saul died and David took over the kingdom. So if you subtract the 30 years old that David was when he became the king from the 38 years that Saul lived beyond this and ruled, you find out that when God says, I have sought another man and I have already commanded him to rule and to do these things, you'll find out that this is eight years before David was even born. So eight years before David was born, God had a plan for his life. God sought out and prepared him a person not just somebody who was already living and already had these talents and God thought, I can use that. No, God chose someone and spoke to them and commanded and ordained a purpose for their life eight years before they were born. Boy, that's major. I don't know if you understand this. But again, it just reinforces some of the points I've already made. You aren't a mistake. It's not up to you to just pick and choose what you want to do. God has a purpose for your life. You need to find out what that purpose for your life is. And you need to fulfill it. It's the only way that you will ever be fulfilled, and it's the only way that other people's lives will be touched the way that God is wanting to touch them. He has to have people to work through. So here's David who is sought out. And to me, this just really ministers to me that David wasn't God's first choice. If Saul would have obeyed God, we would have never heard of David. This was a second choice, plan B. And yet think about this. Think about how awesome David's life was. Man, David went out and killed Goliath. David did so many things. God used him miraculously. David was a man of integrity. There were so many great things that happened. We look back and think, how could it have been any better? Well, apparently, this was God's plan B. It wasn't his plan A. Saul was God's plan A. And, you know, if you are familiar with this, in the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, you see Jonathan, Saul's son, who was a powerful, powerful man of God, and went out, and, I mean, he did something equivalent to what David did when he killed Goliath. He went over by himself, just with his armor bearer, and they defeated the Philistines by themselves, and God wrought great deliverance. And Jonathan was a great man of integrity, and God had it set up. It looked like that the, the heir to Saul's throne would have been a person that was, certainly would have at least equaled what David did. And yet none of that came to pass because Saul missed God's purpose on his life. David wasn't plan A, he was plan B, and yet look how wonderful it was. So my purpose in bringing this out is to say that some of you feel like that, man, I've just missed God. I know that God had a purpose for my life. I rebelled, or either you rebelled or you just were in uh, sensitive and did your own thing, and I'm out of time. I'll have to continue this next week. <laughs> Amen. Please listen as our announcer gives you this information and call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Find God's Will, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. This series is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 16 pounds when you write or call. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the God's Will package, which includes three albums, How to Find God's Will, how to follow God's will, and how to fulfill God's will. As a bonus, the package includes the Destiny Stories DVD, highlighting four stories of people whose lives were transformed as they pursued God's will for their lives. The entire package has a catalog value of 48 pounds, but Andrew considers this teaching so important, he'd like to get it to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering it to you for a gift of just 40 pounds or more. Remember to specify the CD or DVD package when you order. 
The second audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD titled, It's Never Too Late, Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, God Wants You Well, for eight pounds 50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. There's much more than just classroom activity at Karis Bible College. Students participate in hands-on ministry, like the 36 students who recently went on a mission trip to Mexico. Men will put up the tent in the morning, women will go out to the streets passing out uh, invitations to the tent meetings. This CBC outreach to Mexico resulted in 112 salvations, 33 baptisms in the Holy Spirit, and nearly 40 healings with 14 outstanding miracles recorded. 17 children got born again that day, the day that I taught and offered salvation, and those same 17 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. The students of Karis Bible College are ambassadors for Andrew Womack Ministries in Mexico and wherever they minister around the world. Invest yourself in Andrew Womack Ministries today. We got a brother who got the hold of Andrew's materials in Riga, and he was a professional um, announcer on uh, radio. And uh, he decided he was going to start reading Andrew's books for 20 minutes a day, a special program on radio in uh, Latvia. Uh, so in Latvian, he sits down every day, and he's now on Andrew, th the third of Andrew's books. And he just reads it 20 minutes a day, and people are contacting him. And he's now given up two days of his job a week to sit down and translate materials because he sees it as a means of helping to change his nation. And that's what it's about. You know, there is darkness out there, but praise God, the darkness has not overcome the light. And the light of this word that Andrew is bringing is going from nation to nation. Krakow, Poland, an ancient and beautiful city, famous as the early home of the man who became Pope John Paul II. He presided at the Vatican for 27 years as one of the most faithful and godly Catholic leaders of all time. And of course, Andrew had the opportunity to minister to the Polish people in a very unlikely setting. This is in a bar. There's about uh, five or six churches that have come together. They're expecting anywhere around 400 people to come together. It'll be my first time to minister here. And uh, we had one church that rented a bus and brought 50 people. 